One statement that is occasionally heard from some Muslims today is the claim that they are descended from Christ through the Ebionites. So give me your historical evidence for these people who followed the teachings of Jesus that none of them contradicts what the Quran says. Ebionites. Who are they? They are a they group believe? of... Uh, the did Eb they believe Jesus was crucified? No. No? What else do they believe? They didn't believe he was a, tr uh, he didn't believe he was a god. They didn't believe he was, a, uh, uh, he was part of a trinity. So why did they call it Ebonites? Ebonites is a Jewish, it comes from the word, means poor people. Now you ask me for evidence, I've given you the evidence. What are you going to do with the evidence now? No, no, no. This is what are you going to do with the evidence now? No, no, no. What are you going to do with the evidence now? No, no, no. This is I'm about to end this man's whole career. This assertion is often made to support the idea that we was Christians, implying a historical connection to early Christianity, particularly Second Temple Judaism. Furthermore, these parties tend to think of St. Paul as an infiltrator who went against the teaching of Jesus. However, it is important to note that this claim lacks scholarly support and is typically espoused by individuals with limited knowledge in this field. Tracing one's religious genealogy back to the Old Testament is a significant aspect of Abrahamic traditions. It is crucial to consider modern research and scholarship on the subject. Orthodox Christianity, for instance, is connected to the Israelite traditions, and numerous apologists have provided extensive information on this matter. Uh, just for instance, Orthodox Shahada, Dr. Bo Branson, and Father James Bernstein. However, in this particular video, we will not delve into that topic, as it goes beyond the scope of our discussion. Instead, let us focus on the claim of apostolic succession via the Ebionites and why it is fundamentally flawed and unsubstantiated. Firstly, to give a quick overview, the Ebionites were a Jewish Christian sect that emerged in the early centuries of Christianity. While they had their own distinct beliefs and practices, they were considered heretical by the ancient Orthodox Christians, due to their rejection of certain key doctrines, such as the divinity of Jesus Christ. Just quickly, we must mention that apostolic succession refers to the lineage of bishops and priests traced back to the apostles, who were the original followers of Jesus Christ. It must be noted that this claim is not something that certain other communities with Christian beliefs accept. I got a feeling Birmingham will never be the same, man. <laughs> However, this has always been the teaching of the church. Nevertheless, claiming apostolic succession via the Ebionites is an incorrect and fundamentally flawed assertion. Historically, the Ebionites held views that were incompatible with mainstream Christian beliefs and even modern Islamic beliefs. Their rejection of essential Christian doctrines, such as the divinity of Jesus, puts them at odds with the central teachings of the apostles and the early Christian community. What do Islamic texts claim about Jesus? The Quran often refers to people labeling Muhammad as the mad poet. Majnun. This can be found in chapter 21 verse 5, chapter 37 verse 36, and chapter 52 verse 3. Furthermore, the Quran refers to Muhammad as meaning the one who tells the fairy tales of the previous peoples. These references can be found all over the Quran at chapter 6 verse 25, chapter 8 verse 31, chapter 16 verse 24, chapter 23 verse 83. I can go on and on and on. There's quite a few of these. So at this point, you may be asking the question, why am I providing these references? One very common rhetorical tool used by Islamic preachers is to claim that Christians do not understand the cultural or linguistic richness of the Arabian Peninsula. Therefore, by demonstrating knowledge of the cultural practices of the Arab Bedouins, I can refute this claim. Secondly, these statements taken from the highest Islamic authority, aka the Quran, cannot be refuted unless the opponent wants to claim that the Quran is misreporting the events. Abu Huraira reported Muhammad as saying, The truest word spoken by an Arab in poetry is this verse of Labid. Behold, apart from Allah, everything is in vain. Again, Abu Huraira says, 
Allah's Messenger said, The most truthful saying spoken by a poet is the saying of Labid, Everything but Allah is surely futile. And Umayyah ibn Abi Salt almost embraced Islam. Again, we see another hadith saying, He, that is Umayyah ibn Abi Salt, was about to become a Muslim. And in the hadith transmitted on the authority of Ibn Mahdi, the words are, He was almost a Muslim in his poetry. Firstly, we have no writings from any Ebionite author directly. Therefore, to make the claim that one is descended from the Ebionites is counterintuitive. There's no true way to validate this. The only true way would be for a continuous community of Ebionites to exist, but we don't see that in history. This group disappeared shortly after the first century and and possibly existed into the second century. We, We don't really know. The Ebionites encompassed individuals who were either born into the Jewish faith or embraced Judaism through conversion. Their distinctiveness lay in their steadfast adherence to Jewish customs and their unwavering commitment to observing Jewish laws, encompassing practices such as circumcision, Sabbath observance, and the consumption of kosher food. However, their belief system diverged from traditional Judaism in one pivotal aspect. They acknowledged Jesus as the long-awaited Messiah chosen by God. As for this next section, I have taken these points of belief from Bart D. Ehrman's lecture on the Ebionites found within his book, Lost Christianities, Christian Scriptures and the Battles over Authentication. The Ebionites rejected any notion of Jesus' divinity. They were essentially adoptionists. So according to their perspective, Jesus was entirely human, born through the natural union of Joseph and Mary, and only became God's son through adoption during his baptism. Consequently, the Ebionites did not adhere to the teachings of the virgin birth, Jesus' pre-existence, or the hypostatic union. Secondly, the Ebionites regarded Jesus as the epitome of righteousness, surpassing all others who had walked the earth. Their conviction stemmed from their belief that Jesus, through his virtuous conduct, garnered the favour of God, culminating in his symbolic adoption as the Son of the Almighty. This momentous event occurred during Jesus' baptism at the hands of John the Baptist, which signified his divine appointment and purpose. However, in a fragment given to us by Epiphanius of Salamis, we can see that the narrative doesn't quite match up to the Gospel of Matthew. And I quote from Epiphanius, from his Panarion, When the people were baptised, Jesus also came and was baptized by John. And as he came up from the water, the heavens were opened and he saw the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove that descended and entered into him. And a voice sounded from heaven that said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. And again, I have this day begotten you. And immediately a great light shone around the place. When John saw this, it is said he sent unto him, Who are you, Lord? And again a voice from heaven rang out to him, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And then it is said, John fell down before him and said, I beseech you, Lord, baptize me. But he prevented him and said, Suffer it, for thus it is fitting that everything should be fulfilled. Thirdly, according to the Ebionites, Jesus, as God's chosen Son, bore a profound responsibility to bring in the Messianic age. They believed that the ultimate fulfillment of these expectations necessitated Jesus' sacrificial death, wherein he would bear the weight of humanity's transgressions. In fulfillment of his sacred mission, Jesus valiantly met his untimely demise, surrendering his life for the redemption of humanity's sins. However, the Ebionites' unique perspective did not end with Jesus' crucifixion. They firmly held that God, recognizing Jesus' unwavering commitment and sacrifice, triumphantly resurrected him from the realm of the dead, thus affirming his divine purpose and granting him eternal life. Central to the Ebionite worldview was the conviction that Jesus, as the Jewish Messiah, appointed by the Jewish God, epitomized the saviour of the Jewish people, ensuring the fulfillment of the, that's right, you guessed it, Jewish law. By becoming a member of the Jewish community, an individual could align themselves with the divine will and secure a path to righteousness. 
in essence, the Ebionites' unique amalgamation of Jewish customs, adherence to Jewish laws, and acknowledgement of Jesus as the Messiah forged an extraordinary path in religious thought, underscoring their belief in the inseparable bond between Judaism and the redemptive power of Jesus' life, death, and resurrection. Their profound conviction invited individuals into the fold of Judaism, as they perceived it to be the gateway to righteousness and the key to divine favor. Now, I have a quick question for you, the listener. Does this sound like Islam? Because, in my opinion, this doesn't sound like Islamic doctrine. The fact that the crucifixion is still central to the entire, let's say, creed of this sect makes this something that cannot really gel with Islam. To the Ebionites, Jesus embodied the ultimate and flawless sacrifice, rendering any further sacrificial offerings unnecessary. In fact, this is ultimately what undergirds their strict vegetarianism. In the ancient world, meat was not eaten unless it was given as a sacrifice to God beforehand. In the Ebionites' collective mindset, if sacrifices were done away with by Jesus' sacrifice, there is no need to eat meat. In fact, a fragment of the Gospel of the Ebionites, as recounted to us by Epiphanius of Salamis, says, I am come to do away with sacrifices, and if you cease not sacrificing, the wrath of God will not cease from you. This is from the Panarion. Interestingly, Jesus makes an I am statement here. Another fragment says, Where will you have us prepare the Passover? And he answered, Do I desire at this Passover to eat flesh with you? This so called gospel strongly resembles a rebuttal of Jesus' statements in John chapter 6, where he declares, Amen, amen, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you do not have life within you. It is plausible that the Gospel of the Ebionites is sharing a similar skepticism towards Jesus as the Pharisees did within John chapter 6, by posing the question, how can this man give us his flesh to eat, in the form of the statement by Jesus in this so-called gospel as, do I desire at this Passover to eat flesh with you? It's very interesting that every non-Orthodox form of Christianity seems to have an issue with the change in the elements that occur at the Eucharist. Now that we've had a look at the Ebionite narrative regarding Jesus, let's look at the Quranic narrative. Firstly, the Quranic Jesus is called Isa, contradicting the standard conventions of 7th century Arabian Christians who would have known Jesus as So we'll begin with Quran chapter 3 verse 37 where Maryam, the mother of Isa, is fed by Allah in the sanctuary. So it says, And her Lord accepted her with full acceptance and vouchsafed her to goodly growth, and made Zachariah her guardian. Whenever Zachariah went into the sanctuary where she was, he found that she had food. He said, O Mary, whence cometh unto thee this food? She answered, It is from Allah. Allah giveth without stint to whom he will. As we can see, this is taken from the Proto-Evangelion of James in chapter 8, which is actually written in about 150 AD. And her parents went out marveling and praising the Lord God because the child had not turned back. And Mary was in the temple of the Lord as if she were a dove that dwelt there. And she received food from the hand of an angel. And when she was 12 years old, there was a council of priests saying, Behold, Mary has reached the age of 12 years in the temple of the Lord. Surprisingly, this Islamic belief is actually shared by all Orthodox and Apostolic Christians to this day, as the Proto-Evangelion of James is held in high regard. Moreover, among the 12 feasts in the Orthodox calendar, the dedication of Mary to the temple holds significant importance. Therefore, not only is this not an Ebionite belief, it is an Orthodox Christian belief that has been distorted to match the Quranic narrative. This is the first strike against the Ebionite descendancy hypothesis. So now let us move to the birth of Isa. So in Quran chapter 66 verse 22, 
It says, And Maryam, daughter of Imran, who kept safe her private parts. The word for this is literally farja, which, which literally means like vagina. Um, safeguarded, so it means that she kept her chastity. So we breathed in of it our spirit, and she sincerely believed in the words of her Lord and in his books, and she was one of the devout. Let's note here that farjaha is a very vulgar word, literally meaning vulva. I find it slightly interesting how Muslims want to deride St. Paul for saying scubala in one of his epistles, but they have also this very vulgar language within their own writings. Anyway, to return to the original point, we note that the Ebionite belief is a natural union between Joseph and Mary, so this is the second strike against the Ebionite descendancy hypothesis. So now let's move to the episode of Isa speaking within the cradle. This is Quran chapter 19, verse 29 to 30. So she pointed to the baby. They exclaimed, how can we talk to someone who is an infant in the cradle? He said, I am truly a servant of Allah. He has destined me to be given the scripture and to be a prophet. The source of this is found in the Arabic infancy gospel in chapter 1. And this gospel is purported to have been around since at least the 6th century. So it's contemporary. So to quote, We find what follows in the book of Joseph, the high priest, who lived in the time of Christ. Some say that he is Cephas. He has said that Jesus spoke, and indeed when he was laying in his cradle, said to Mary his mother, I am Jesus, the Son of God, the Logos, whom thou hast brought forth, as the angel Gabriel announced to thee, and my father has sent me for the salvation of the world. Now, whilst the Gospel of the Ebionites does not include an infancy narrative of Jesus, as the first two chapters of Matthew have been removed, it is pertinent to say that the Ebionites regard Jesus' adoption to be at his baptism and not at his birth, so they reject the idea of an incarnation. Again, we have another strike against the Ebionite descendancy hypothesis. Now, let's have a look at the crucifixion narrative. This is the most important part of the entire video, really. In Quran chapter 4, verse 157, it says, And for their saying, Indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus the son of Mary, the messenger of Allah, they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about him. They have no knowledge of it except the following assumption, and they did not kill him for certain. So the source for this is actually a Gnostic text from 200 AD, and it's called The Second Treatise of the Great Seth. So I'm not going to read this whole thing, um, but I do want to mention one point, which says, Yes, they saw me, they punished me. It was another, their father, who drank the gall and the vinegar. It was not I. They struck me with the reed. It was another Simon who bore the cross on his shoulder. I was another upon whom they placed the crown of thorns, but I was rejoicing in the height over all the wealth of the archons. So anytime you hear archons mentioned, this is a Gnostic text. Um, So you can see, the Islamic view cannot align with the Ebionites' beliefs, as Jesus was considered the ultimate sacrifice to abolish all others. Additionally, the Ebionite understanding of Jesus' resurrection portrayed it as his reward for fulfilling his duty as a sacrifice for all sins. Consequently, this disparity likely represents the most significant point of divergence between the Ebionites and Islam. While Islam acknowledges the concept of a human messiah, the notion of a singular sacrifice to nullify all others does not find a place within it. Even today, goats and sheep are offered as sacrifices to Allah, not to mention that most Muslims consume meat as a part of their diet. And to shed light on the actual source from which Islam derived this narrative, it becomes evident that Islam shares more similarities with Gnostic Christology rather than Ebionite Christology. However, it has become trendy in recent times to label the Ebionites as anti-Pauline Christians who paved the way for the emergence of Islam. This claim could not be further from the truth, Even if this was the case that the Ebionites transformed into uh, Islam itself, the stark divergence of beliefs would demonstrate the lack of preservation of Ebionite beliefs over time. The preservation of correct beliefs is a promise from God, 
as stated in both the Old and New Testament. A God who can't protect his own writings, his own scriptures, is no God that should be followed.